In this lecture, we're going to discuss community-acquired pneumonia. Community-acquired pneumonia is defined as pneumonia occurring outside of the setting of hospitalization, or a pneumonia occurring within 48 hours of hospital admission. In that situation, less than 48 hours is not enough time for the pneumonia to have been picked up in the hospital. It's important that we learn about community-acquired pneumonia because it is the most common infectious cause of death in the United States. The most common culprit? Streptococcus pneumoniae. There are several pathogens which most commonly cause community-acquired pneumonia, and they have certain epidemiologic and demographic associations that you should be aware of for step two. The first is H-flu, and this is most commonly associated with COPD. Staphylococcus aureus can cause community-acquired pneumonia, usually in patients after a viral infection, such as influenza. Klebsiella pneumonia is commonly causing pneumonia in patients with alcoholism and diabetes. Anaerobes can also cause a community-acquired pneumonia. Because anaerobes are part of the typical mouth flora, patients with poor dentition, and in particular, those who are aspirating, can develop anaerobic community-acquired pneumonia. Mycoplasma pneumonia can also cause pneumonia, and this typically occurs in young healthy patients, often in settings where many people are living in very close quarters, such as a military base or a college dormitory. Similarly, chlamydophilia pneumonia can also cause pneumonia in young healthy patients, but you should be aware that this type of pneumonia can result in hoarseness of the voice. Legionella can also cause community-acquired pneumonia, and this is usually found in places with contaminated water sources. Usually, air conditioning or ventilation systems are the culprit. Then we have chlamydia acidicae. This type of chlamydial pneumonia is usually associated with birds and is only seen in people who have very close contact with birds. Lastly, coxiella is another less common cause of pneumonia, and this is usually in people who have very close contact with animals at the time of giving birth, or in veterinarians or farmers. While all forms of pneumonia present with fever and cough, only the most severe cases will present with the following. Dyspnea, abnormalities of vital signs including tachycardia, hypotension, or tachypnea, or mental status changes. Importantly, the way to differentiate pneumonia from bronchitis is that dyspnea, high fever, and an abnormal chest x-ray are indicative of pneumonia, while these are typically not seen in bronchitis. In some types of pneumonia, the clinical presentation can also include GI symptoms, including abdominal pain or diarrhea. This is thought to happen because the lower lobes can irritate the intestines through their close contact with the diaphragm. Legionella is particularly well known for this. Chills or rigors are also sometimes associated with pneumonia and can be a sign of bacteremia. Usually, strep pneumo is going to be the cause of pneumonia most often associated with bacteremia. Chest pain, usually pleuritic in nature, can also occur from the inflammation of the pleura. And hypothermia, while not as common, is just as bad as fever in terms of pathologic and prognostic significance. On the USMLE Step 2, you are very likely to hear abnormal breath sounds as part of the multimedia portion of the exam. With regard to pneumonia, if you hear dullness to percussion, that's going to be indicative of a large pleural effusion. If the patient has a consolidation in their lung, such as a low bar pneumonia, there are two different ways you can tell this on physical exam. The first would be the presence of bronchial sounding breath sounds over that area of consolidation, or the presence of egophony. Either one of these is indicative of airspace consolidation. While we've already discussed organism-specific associations with regard to epidemiologic and demographic information, there are also some clinical presentations that are associated with certain organisms. The following are important for you to know for step two. For Klebsiella pneumonia, we sometimes see hemoptysis. 
This is because Klebsiella can cause necrotizing disease, and usually this kind of hemoptysis is described as appearing as current jelly sputum. Anaerobic bacteria usually result in extremely foul-smelling sputum, sometimes given the scent of rotten eggs. Mycoplasma pneumonia usually results in a dry cough and very rarely a severe bolus meningitis. Legionella pneumonia, as we've already mentioned, sometimes has gastrointestinal symptoms such as pain, diarrhea, or even some CNS symptoms such as headache or confusion. Lastly, pneumocystis pneumonia is usually seen in patients with AIDS with a CD4 count less than 200. In the situation where a patient with pneumonia has primarily a dry or non-productive cough, there are certain bugs you should think about as the culprits. The first would be mycoplasma, and others include viruses, coxiella, pneumocystis, and chlamydia. The reason for this is that these bugs preferentially involve the interstitial space in the lung. The air spaces of the alveoli are actually empty and quite healthy in these conditions. That's why there's less sputum production. In a lobar bacterial pneumonia, the alveoli will be filled with pus and the cough will be productive of discolored sputum. In an interstitial pneumonia, such as those caused by the organisms on the previous slide, there's going to be much less sputum production because the disease is primarily in the interstitium and not in the alveoli. And in addition, one other tip to remember for step two is that specific sputum colors are not helpful in determining the etiology of a pneumonia. In fact, the color of the sputum does not even help you distinguish between viral and bacterial causes of lung infection. In terms of diagnostic tests, the best initial test for all respiratory infections is going to be a chest x-ray. However, this is not very helpful in determining a specific etiology. For that, you need sputum gram stain and sputum culture. The best ways to determine the specific etiology is going to be to grow the bug itself. However, many organisms cannot be detected in this method and therefore other diagnostics are often needed. With regard to the atypical pneumonias, these organisms are typically not seen on gram stain and they're not culturable on standard blood agar. As we'll see shortly, there are other diagnostic tests that can be used, but these are not going to grow from standard methods. Mycoplasma, chlamydia, legionella, coxiella, and viruses all fall into this category. Importantly, while we can't grow them out on standard blood agar, all of these bugs result in 30 to 50% of cases of community-acquired pneumonia. Here's an image of a right middle lobe infiltrate consistent with bacterial pneumonia. As you can see, the minor fissure is shown as separating the middle and upper lobes of the right lung. In addition, one other clue to tell whether a pneumonia is in the right middle lobe is that dense infiltrates in this area will obscure the right heart border. Because the right middle lobe and the heart sit anteriorly in the chest, any infiltrate in the right middle lobe is going to obscure that right heart border on the chest x-ray. While the chest x-ray we just looked at is consistent with a focal lobar bacterial pneumonia, sometimes the chest x-ray will be much less focal and will actually have bilateral interstitial infiltrates. This is usually seen in mycoplasma, viruses, coxiella, pneumocystis, chlamydia, these patients, as we've already said, are diagnosed with atypical pneumonias and usually have a non-productive cough, and their x-rays can actually lag behind the clinical findings. Remember, especially with these atypical pneumonias, the first chest x-ray can be falsely negative in 10 to 20% of patients. So if the patient does not improve with your empiric antibiotic choices, you may want to pursue a second chest x-ray. Here is an example of interstitial infiltrates in the bilateral lungs, which are leaving the air spaces spared. This x-ray might be consistent with any of the atypical pneumonias, including PCP, mycoplasma, viral, or chlamydia. 
In community-acquired pneumonia, blood cultures are typically negative, but can be positive in about 5 to 15% of cases. This is particularly common with strep pneumo. With regard to sputum cultures, you should remember that a sputum gram stain is considered adequate if you have greater than 25 white blood cells per high power field and less than 10 epithelial cells. If these numbers are not met, in other words, if there are greater than 10 epithelial cells and less than 25 whites, you're likely dealing with a sample that is mostly saliva and not really indicative of what's going on in the lung. Sometimes, if a diagnosis remains elusive, further chest imaging can be obtained with a chest CT or a chest MRI. These do show greater definition of abnormalities, but they still do not determine a specific microbiologic etiology. One tip to follow for step two is that in infectious diseases, a radiologic test is hardly ever the most accurate test. Sometimes, patients will have severe disease and will not respond to your initial treatment or the etiology remains unclear. In this situation, one thing to think about is the evidence of a large pleural effusion. If you see an effusion on the chest x-ray and the patient is thought to have pneumonia clinically, you must perform thoracentesis. Any new large effusion seen on a chest x-ray should be analyzed. An infected pleural fluid is also known as an empyema. Empyema basically acts like an abscess and therefore only improves if you drain it with a chest tube. On your screen, you can see how thoracentesis is performed. It involves the insertion of a needle into the pleural space and removal of the fluid and eventually insertion of a chest tube for continued drainage. With regard to the etiology of pleural effusions, we typically divide this into two categories, transudative and exudative. A transudative pleural effusion is secondary to either an increase in the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure or a decrease in the intravascular oncotic pressure. The bottom line is that in a transudative effusion, the capillaries themselves are working just fine. The issue is that the balance of starling forces that is, hydrostatic pressure and oncotic pressure, favors the exiting of fluid out of the vessels into the interstitial space and eventually into the pleural space. In the situation of an exudative effusion, there's actually damage to the vessel walls and there's increased vascular permeability in those pulmonary capillaries. They simply become very leaky and start to leak their contents into the pleural space. Empyema is defined as infected pleural fluid, and there are certain criteria that you must use to diagnose whether pleural fluid is in fact an empyema. These include a fluid LDH greater than 60% of the serum value of LDH, or a fluid total protein greater than 50% of the serum total protein. Other criteria include a pH less than 7.2, a positive gram stain, a positive culture, or frank pus in the fluid. Remember, any new large effusion associated with a pneumonia must be tapped in order to analyze the fluid for these criteria. In certain situations, taking a direct look at the lung with bronchoscopy may be necessary. This is only needed if the sputum stain and culture and the blood cultures do not yield a particular organism and the patient's condition is worsening despite empiric antibiotic therapy. One exception would be pneumocystis pneumonia, which is extremely difficult to grow without actually performing a bronchoscopy. In addition to the diagnostics already mentioned, there are certain diagnostic tests that are very specific and can be used for certain types of bacteria. For strep pneumo, you can test for the antigen in the patient's urine. Other tests include, for mycoplasma, the evidence of mycoplasma PCR in the serum, cold agglutinins in the serum, serologies or antibodies against mycoplasma, or you can grow mycoplasma on certain special culture media. For chlamydia pneumonias as well as coxiella, you can simply use serologic titers, which, if rising from a previous baseline, 
are indicative of a current infection. For Legionella, there's also a urine antigen similar to that for strep pneumo, or you can culture Legionella on a charcoal yeast extract. Lastly, for PCP pneumonia, you have to do bronchial alveolar lavage, or BAL, to get a good enough sample to tell if a patient has PCP. Moving on to management of community-acquired pneumonia, there are several important points to remember for step two. The first is that it is rare to have a specific organism identified at the time that treatment is initiated. However, if you do develop a certain organism on gram stain, you can then begin to narrow your antibiotics toward that particular organism. Overall, the most important step in determining management is to determine the severity of the disease. This is going to tell you in which location to treat the patient, either in the hospital or as an outpatient. In addition to telling you where to treat the patient, the severity of disease also drives the initial therapy. Also, remember that mycoplasma and chlamydia are rarely confirmed because they're usually just treated empirically. They get better with first-line community-acquired pneumonia antibiotics. If a patient is deemed to be eligible for outpatient management, the following algorithm is helpful. If the patient is previously healthy and has had no antibiotics in the past three months and symptoms are quite mild, you can use either a macrolide like azithromycin or clarithromycin or doxycycline. If the patient has medical comorbidities or has used antibiotics in the past three months, you're better off going with a respiratory fluoroquinolone such as levofloxacin or moxifloxacin. If the patient is admitted to the hospital, intravenous antibiotics should be given. This can be a respiratory fluoroquinolone like levofloxacin or moxifloxacin, or more commonly, ceftriaxone and azithromycin, both given intravenously. Another tip for step two is that almost all infectious diseases are initially treated empirically, that is, without a specific etiology. Once you have a certain bug, you can narrow your antibiotics to that particular organism. With regard to the decision of whether to admit a patient to the hospital or to treat as an outpatient, there are several tools we can use. 80% of patients are actually treated as outpatients with oral antibiotics and they do just fine. However, patients with severe disease need to be hospitalized. This is defined as a combination of hypotension, systolic less than 90, a respiratory rate greater than 30, a PaO2 of less than 60 millimeters of mercury, or a pH in the arterial blood of less than 7.35, an elevated BUN greater than 30, or sodium less than 130, glucose greater than 250, a pulse of greater than 125 per minute, any mental status changes such as confusion, or a temperature greater than 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Also, if the patient is greater than 65 or has comorbidities such as cancer, COPD, CHF, renal failure, or liver disease. Any combination of these criteria should result in hospitalization. However, if hypoxia or hypotension are present, and even if these are just single factors that are present, are enough to admit the patient for community-acquired pneumonia. And remember, the chest x-ray does not guide admission because it cannot tell the severity of hypoxia. Another tool that you can use is called the CURB-65 rule, which has been validated in multiple studies. The C stands for confusion, the U for uremia, the R for respiratory distress, and the B for BP low. Together, these spell out CURB, and the number 65 means age 65. So if the patient has any one of those four criteria or has an age 65 or greater, they should be admitted for management of community-acquired pneumonia. Let's pause now for a practice question. We have a 65-year-old woman hospitalized with community-acquired pneumonia. Sputum gram stain shows gram-positive diplococci, but the sputum culture does not grow. Chest x-ray has a low-ball infiltrate and a large effusion. She's placed on ceftriaxone and azithromycin, and thoracentesis is performed. 
which has a markedly elevated LDH and a protein level with 17,000 white blood cells. The blood cultures grow streptococcus pneumoniae with a MIC to penicillin less than 0.1. Oxygen saturation is 96% on room air and the blood pressure is 110 over 70, temperature 102, and a pulse of 112. What is the next step in management? The answer choices include repeated thoracentesis, placement of a chest tube for suction, adding ampicillin to treatment, placing the patient in the ICU, or consulting pulmonary. The correct answer is B, placement of a chest tube for suction. This patient has an infected pleural effusion or empyema. This will respond only to drainage by a chest tube or thoracostomy. Remember, a large effusion acts like an abscess and is hard to sterilize. Repeated thoracentesis is wrong. Remember, each side of the chest can accommodate about two to three liters of fluid. If you simply drain it and don't place a chest tube, this fluid is going to reaccumulate and the patient will be back at square one. Adding ampicillin to treatment does nothing because you're not getting any additional antibiotic coverage that's not already covered by ceftriaxone. There is no need to be in the ICU just because of an effusion or a chest tube. The patient is not unstable and despite the effusion has no evidence of instability. Pulse is only mildly abnormal and the blood pressure and the pulse ox are within normal limits. On step two, calling a consult is hardly ever the correct answer. In this situation, pulmonary consultation will not add anything. Here's a chest x-ray that actually shows what the previously mentioned patients might look like. You see a large left pleural effusion with evidence of a large meniscus sign. Only a sample from this fluid can determine the specific cause of the effusion and therefore the potential need for a chest tube. Sometimes when a patient has a large pleural effusion, it is useful to lay them on their side for a lateral decubitus x-ray. If the effusion is mobile, it's going to layer out and you'll see it falling sideways along the patient's side as seen in this picture. However, if the effusion is not mobile and is stuck together or loculated, you may not see the effusion layer out when you lay the patient on their side. In that situation, you might be more concerned that the patient has developed loculations and infected pleural fluid. Some patients with empyema will actually develop error in the pleural space in addition to fluid. We call this a hydropneumothorax. As you can see in the picture, there's evidence of both fluid and error in this chest CT. Again, chest tube drainage is the most effective way to remove this condition. To end our lecture, let's briefly touch on the pneumococcal vaccination. This is a vaccination against strep pneumo and therefore helps to prevent a large number of community-acquired pneumonias. Anybody greater than 65 years old should receive a vaccination with a 23 polyvalent vaccine. Patients with chronic heart disease, liver, kidney, or lung disease should also receive this. This includes asthma, and these patients all should be vaccinated as soon as their underlying disease is apparent. It does not matter what their age is at time of diagnosis. Some other reasons to vaccinate people for pneumococcus would include functional or anatomic asplenia, such as a patient with sickle cell disease. If the spleen is not working, patients will have a very hard time combating organisms with an encapsulation, such as strep pneumo. Hematologic malignancy, like leukemia or lymphoma. Immunosuppressed patients, including diabetics, alcoholics, corticosteroid users, or patients with AIDS or HIV positivity. Lastly, patients with CSF leaks or cochlear implantation should also receive the pneumococcal vaccine. In patients who are generally healthy, they can be given a single dose at age 65. If the first vaccination was given before 65 or with the other conditions as previously described, then a second dose should also be given five years after the first dose. Importantly, healthcare workers do not need the pneumococcal vaccine. This concludes our lecture on community-acquired pneumonia.